Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and today I'm going to deal with picture tests and practical anatomy of the thorax. The video today is about the thoracic wall, lungs, and pleura, part one. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. A 51-year-old male admitted to the hospital with severe dyspnea. Radiographic examination reveals a tension pneumothorax. Air accumulates in which of the following numbered spaces? Pneumothorax is the presence of air in the pleural cavity, and in tension pneumothorax, air enters the pleural cavity during inspiration, but it cannot leave during expiration, causing an increased accumulation of air. Air accumulation will not only compress the lung, but it will push the mediastinum to the other side, compressing the other lung and killing the patient. Now let's find where the pleural cavity is located. There are two pleural cavities, one on either side of the mediastinum. So the cavity is a potential space that is located between the parietal pleura that lines the thoracic wall and the visceral pleura that covers the lung surface. The space looks bigger in this horizontal section of the thorax because of the tissue shrinkage that takes place during plastination to preserve the specimen. Otherwise, the space the pleural cavity contains only a thin film of serous fluid called the pleural fluid between the visceral and parietal layers. The serous pleural fluid lubricates the pleural surfaces, allows the layers of pleura to slide smoothly over each other during respiration, and in addition, its surface tension provides a cohesion that keeps the lung surface intact with the thoracic wall. So the correct answer here is that the air accumulates in four. But let's look at the other spaces. One is located in the subcutaneous tissue, and it may contain air after a penetrating trauma of the respiratory passages, but this results in what we call a subcutaneous emphysema, not a pneumothorax. Two, the space is the pericardial cavity, and it might contain air in a condition known as pneumopericardium, not pneumothorax. In pneumopericardium, air is introduced into the pericardial cavity from a penetrating wound. Three is actually inside the cavity of the left ventricle, and five is pointing at the inside of the arch of the aorta. Both three and five have no relation to pneumothorax. Identify the lung lobe. What is the name of its counterpart on the contralateral lung? and identify the fissure B, which lobes of the lung it separates. This is a sagittal section of the thorax, and the section is to the right of the midline. You can see here the liver below the right dome of the diaphragm. Note the conical shape of the lung. It has a base and an apex. And note that this lung, which is the right lung, as the section passes to the right, the oblique fissure divides the organ into separate superior and inferior lobes, upper and lower lobes. B is the horizontal fissure, and this fissure passes from the anterior margin of the lung toward the oblique fissure to separate a wedge-shaped lobe of the right lung called the middle lobe. It separates it from the upper lobe. There is no middle lobe in the left lung, but there is a tongue-like projection of the upper lobe at the cardiac notch, which corresponds to the right middle lobe. This structure, which is the counterpart of the middle lobe of the right lung, is called the lingula. Identify the fissure A, which lobes of the lung it separates, and identify the heart chamber B. This is a sagittal section of the thorax. The section is to the left of the midline. You can see the small left lobe of the liver under the diaphragm, and also you can see the rugae of the stomach below the left dome of the diaphragm. Also note the conical shape of the lung with a base and an apex. You can see that this lung has two lobes and one fissure. The fissure, indicated A, is obviously oblique, and it is the oblique fissure that separates between the upper and lower lobes 
of the left lung. Note that because of the obliquity of the fissure, the lower lobe of the lung is mostly posterior, while the upper lobe of the lung is mostly anterior. This should be taken into consideration during clinical examination and in locating lesions in the lung field in a lateral chest x-ray. Also, you can see that because this is the left lung, there is a very deep cardiac impression, and this is mainly formed by the left ventricle. You can also tell that it's the left ventricle based on the circular profile of the section as compared with the crescentic profile of the section of the right ventricle that is located anterior to it. And you can see the bulging interventricular septum. The septum has the same thickness of the left ventricle. Also, you can see the papillary muscles and the trabeculae carni that are projecting into the wall of the cavity of the ventricle. Please note that this is the cardiac impression, not the cardiac notch. The left lung has a cardiac notch and a deep cardiac impression, which is produced by the left ventricle, while the right lung has a shallow cardiac impression produced by the right ventricle, but it doesn't have a cardiac notch. Identify the structure A. What is the name of the opening located in it? This is a transverse section of the thorax giving a view of the diaphragm from above. Note the two domes of the diaphragm, the right dome and the left dome. And in between these two muscular domes, there is the central tendon of the diaphragm. It appears whitish because it lacks muscle fibers and is formed of fibrous tissue. Passing through this central tendon of the diaphragm and slightly to the right is the inferior vena cava and you can see its opening here at the level of T8. The other opening on the left side represents a section in the descending thoracic aorta. In front of it is the esophagus. It is only the inferior vena cava that passes through the central tendon of the diaphragm. Therefore, the inferior vena cava is not going to be compressed when the muscular part of the diaphragm contracts and descends during inspiration. The descent of the diaphragm decreases intrathoracic pressure and helps in inspiration. Remember that the diaphragm is the main respiratory muscle, but the descent of the diaphragm also increases intra-abdominal pressure and pushes venous blood up against the gravity in the inferior vena cava, which remains open as it passes through the diaphragm because it passes through the non-contractile part of the diaphragm. B is the costodiaphragmatic recess of pleura. It is located at the junction of the costal and the diaphragmatic parts of the parietal pleura. Note that it is not only at the inferior margin of the costal pleura, but it is located at the anterior, lateral, and posterior margins of the diaphragmatic pleura, where it overlaps the upper pole of the kidney, especially the left kidney. The costodiaphragmatic recess is lower posteriorly than anteriorly, and it descends from the level of the 8th rib at the midclavicular line to that of the 12th rib at the scapular line. In the mid-axillary line, it is located at the level of the 10th rib. The inferior level of pleural reflections is usually two ribs higher than the inferior border of the lung. These pleural recesses, the costodiaphragmatic recesses, whether on the left or on the right, are like pockets in which the two layers of the parietal pleura are opposed to each other. The pockets accommodate lung expansion into them during deep inspiration. Remember that the lung is two ribs higher than the inferior border of the pleura. Also, these recesses provide a potential space in which fluid can collect in the pleural cavity. In pleural effusion and under the influence of gravity, fluid first collects in the costodiaphragmatic recesses because they are the dependent, and the fluid appears as a fluid level in chest x-ray. So radiologists call this region of the recess the costophrenic angle, and it is the first place where a fluid level can be detected in a chest x-ray. Which of these locations participates in the formation of a synovial joint, and which of these locations is most vulnerable to fracture. 
This is a typical rib where you can see the wet shape of the head, which is located posteriorly. Then we have the neck represented by one. Then the tubercle, which has two locations, a medial area, which is a smooth facet indicated by number two. This is the articular part that forms the costa transverse joint. And this is a synovial joint, which is between the tubercle and the transverse process of the numerically corresponding vertebra. And then you have three, which is the rough non-articular part that provide for the attachment of a ligament called the lateral costo transverse ligament. Then the shaft follows, and you can see that the shaft proceeds until it reaches the area four, which is called the angle of the rib. And this is the point of greatest change in curvature of the rib. Because of that, it is the weakest part of the rib. And it is where the rib tends to break. It doesn't mean that the rib does not break at other locations, but this is the most vulnerable to fracture. Five is the groove that is parallel with the inferior border of the rib, and it is called the costal groove that provides protection for the intercostal neurovascular bundle. And six is the anterior end of the rib where this area is for articulation with the costal cartilage at a costochondral joint. This is a synchondrosis, a type of cartilaginous joint, not a synovial joint. So the synovial joint is formed at two. Please note that in the head of the rib, which is wedge-shaped, there are two facets that also participate in the formation of synovial joints with the body of thoracic vertebrae. These joints are called costovertebral joints. Which chamber of the heart produces this impression? And the photomicrograph represents a section in which of the tubal structures. This is a mediastinal or medial surface of a lung. You can tell that it is a left lung by looking at the general shape and mentally trying to fit it in your chest. And to confirm that, we can see the deep cardiac notch here and the presence of a lingula. These are features of the left lung and not the right lung. Therefore, the cardiac impression A on the medial surface of the left lung is related to the left ventricle. Now let's look at the structures one, two, three, and four. They are located in the hilum of the lung where structures enter and leave the lung. These structures together, they constitute what we call the root of the lung. Within the root of the lung are located a main bronchus represented as one. You can tell by the thickness of its wall and the presence of cartilage in the wall as well. In addition, the bronchus is generally located behind the artery. The artery too is the pulmonary artery. The artery is usually located above, A for A, artery above, B for B, bronchus behind. Three and four are the two pulmonary veins located anteriorly and inferiorly. Now the wall of the tubal structure in the photomicrograph is not that of a blood vessel. You can see that the epithelium is not a simple squamous epithelium or endothelium as in blood vessels, but it is a pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, a respiratory epithelium. And deep to the epithelium, although there are smooth muscles like the ones that are present in the tunica media of a vessel, but in addition, we can see also the presence of cartilage, which is obviously not present in the wall of a blood vessel. Also, there are mucus secreting glands. These features indicate that the section is from the bronchial tree. And to be specific, it is a section of a bronchus, so it matches with one.